ripped off, out of pocket, short changed. No one likes getting a bad deal. But knowing who to trust can be tough. None of these people can help. They all pass me on. So when your money is under threat and you think you've lost out, Rip Off Britain is here to help. We'll be investigating the companies that you say are letting you down. My life was in the balance. We will see a compassion. And we'll be taking on the scammers that are causing you heartache and misery. I felt sick. I knew I'd been scammed. So whether it's a mistake that's left you out of pocket or a blatant rip-off, we're here to help you find out what you can do about it. This is Rip Off Britain. Hello and welcome to Rip Off Britain, the programme that's on your side when companies that should be making life easier are actually causing stress and worry. Coming up today, we meet the homeowners for whom one essential household bill has increased almost tenfold, leaving them feeling like they're flushing money down the toilet. I can't carry on. It's, I, I actually just can't afford it. It's just a continuous circle, really, of um, them charging whatever they like and me struggling to pay it. Plus, if you fall victim to scammers, can you rely on your bank to actually return your money? There's a big difference in how different banks treat similar cases. And as we'll be hearing later, it might even be enough to make you consider changing who you bank with. And our advice clinic experts will be coming to the aid of a woman who has left hundreds of pounds out of pocket and wrongly accused of breaking the rules when she tried to sell some unwanted concert tickets. Personal finance expert Emma Munbo will be riding to the rescue. But first, anyone who's had the awful job of sorting out the affairs of a loved one after they die will know just how emotionally tough that can be, especially when it comes to things like settling their final bills or closing their accounts. So when you come across a company that really does make it easier for you, it can feel like a huge weight has been lifted. But as the people in our next film discovered, when a company gets it wrong, it can feel doubly upsetting. I love my mum. I spent a lot of time with her in the last three years since my dad died. Lavinia Long from Bromley lost her mum, Barbara, in June 2022. I took her to lovely places. She came down here to stay with us. Uh, we celebrated my 60th birthday together, which was lovely. After Barbara died, Lavinia began the emotionally grueling job of sorting out her mum's affairs. And that included closing down her energy account with Scottish Power. Now, like many firms, it has a dedicated bereavement team that should be well versed in how to effectively and sensitively close down the accounts of the deceased. I spoke to the bereavement team and he was very sympathetic and said that mum was in credit of £641.55 and that would be reimbursed to me. And I thought that would be it. Instead came a letter congratulating Lavinia on her recent home move. Well, of course, Lavinia hadn't moved at all. Her mum's old Scottish Power account had been reassigned to Lavinia. Now, that letter hurt. I was completely grief-stricken, the fact that somebody could send me, who has lost their mum, a letter saying, welcome to your new home. I could not, I couldn't believe it. And then in September, another error. A cheque arrived to reimburse the £641 credit on Barbara's account, but it was made out to Barbara. I don't understand why they would address a letter to me and then not give me the cheque, but payable to my mum who's dead, and the account is closed. Resolving all of this became far more of an ordeal than Lavinia ever expected. I had to send them a death certificate, then I had to do my passport, um, and then I had to prove my address. I found it all pretty horrendous, to be quite honest with you. Lavinia was in the process of selling her mum's house, and even though it stood empty, a small energy bill still had to be paid to Scottish Power. Before she paid up, though, Lavinia wanted the energy company to issue the refund cheque correctly. However, a further two cheques were sent and made out to Barbara. And in the meantime, Lavinia was slapped with a late payment penalty. I was stressed. I was distraught. Could not believe that after all the phone calls, emails, sending all the documentation that they required, 
are still give me the same check. Despite her repeated calls to Scottish Power and the fact that the refund check just couldn't be cashed, the firm then instructed debt collectors to pursue Lavinia. She turned to the Energy Ombudsman for help. It instructed Scottish Power to reimburse the credit on the account, pay £200 compensation as a gesture of goodwill and write a letter of apology. But I'm afraid three months on, Lavinia has had none of those things and no suggestion of a sensitivity expected from Scottish Power's bereavement team. Every day, it was relentless. Scottish Power would call me demanding that I pay. It was beyond my comprehension of how they could treat somebody who was grieving the loss of their mum, who was trying to get back the credit, and they would still keep going on, and I explained it, and I just lost my understanding of how Scottish Power could treat a human being like that. Every energy company should have a bereavement team. And in the eyes of the energy industry trade body, Energy UK, they are there to help alleviate stress and anxiety. But sadly, Lavinia is not the only person who says Scottish Power was the cause of stress and anxiety. In December 2022, Steve Quinn from Liverpool lost his father-in-law, Joe, and then just three months later, his sister-in-law, Linda, as well. The double loss hit everybody really hard. At the time, it came as a great shock. This really pulled the rug out from under my wife. Julie took the passing of both Linda and Joe quite badly at times. A lot of heartache. Steve stepped in to help sort out Joe and Linda's affairs, and that included closing their energy account with Scottish Power. The final balance showed an outstanding bill of £136 for gas, but a credit of more than £1,400 for electricity. Steve wanted Scottish Power to deduct the gas bill from the credit and pay back the rest. Instead, the firm's next move left the whole family reeling. A letter arrived from a law firm acting on behalf of the energy company. It reads, we received notification from our client, Scottish Power, that Mr. Julie Davis had sadly passed away. Please accept our sincere condolences. This was extremely upsetting for my wife, Julie, to then have such a massive error. Steve complained to Scottish Power about the letter and says that during his dealings with the company, he never received the compassionate and sensitive treatment that energy companies should provide. As the anniversary of Joe's death approaches, Steve is still battling to get the bills sorted, the credit balance repaid, and the whole sorry mess sorted out once and for all. I'm angry. I'm dumbfounded. I don't feel that the bereavement team are there to help you along the way. It's a constant need to recap and go through the whole story of where you're up to again with a different operator. Well, Scottish Power told us that it was very sorry for both Steve and Lavinia's experiences at what was an already difficult time. And it stressed that this was not the standard of customer service that it works to deliver. Scottish Power said that the problems Steve's family experienced were caused by a technical issue with the electricity meter. Once that was resolved, the firm says it brought the account up to date, refunded the credit balance and reversed a late payment fee. As for Lavinia's case, Scottish Power says it has implemented all of the Ombudsman's findings in full and once again refunded the credit balance and reversed all late payment fees. Now, both families have also been sent written apologies and a gesture of goodwill in recognition of the shortfall in customer service. Well, I must say I was rather touched by some of those sad situations, but I'm now joined by consumer rights journalist and presenter of Radio 4's Moneybox Live. That's Felicity Hanna. But, Felicity, both those cases, in fact, were with Scottish Power. And I just wonder, what should all energy companies be doing in these situations? 
Well, it might surprise people to know that there are no specific bereavement rules governing how the energy companies behave, but there is best practice, and Energy UK, which represents them, has examples of good practice. So conveying how those staff ought to communicate so that the tone is appropriate, that's really important. And perhaps the most important part of this is to assess the customer's vulnerabilities now. So if they're reporting that their partner has died, for example, are they going to have trouble paying their energy bill in the future? Or if their partner has died and left them with energy debt, do they need extra care? Those are all things these energy firms should be looking at. How much do companies concentrate on training staff? I think that over recent years it has improved, but as we've seen, it can still go wrong. But I think a lot of staff now are told how to deal with bereaved people. And for me, a lot of that is the call centre person taking ownership of the problem, not making the bereaved person have to explain their story over and over again every time they speak to somebody new because they don't have the energy for that. Now, we spoke to Energy UK, which represents the energy industry, and it told us that suppliers' websites all outline the processes they have. They're all in place for handling bereavement cases, and that suppliers do offer training for call centre staff on how to best handle them, as well as offering support for the staff themselves. So, Felicity, if you are unfortunate enough to be dealing with the affairs of a loved one, it can be a very hard time, but just emphasise to me the things that can help. Nothing can make it easy, but there are some things that do make it easier now, and Tell Us Once is one of them. So that's a government service. Tell Us Once, you go online or you let them know that somebody has died, and they will then inform HMRC, the Department for Work and Pensions, the Passport Office, the DVLA, your local council. I should make the point, though, it's not currently available in Northern Ireland, but within the rest of the UK, it's a fantastic service to use. To and just, they will contact all those people. They will make sure that all those government bodies understand that the person on their list has died. Mm. And then there is a commercial company that offers a similar service. There's a company called Settled, which is a free service. It tells 950 different companies about a death once you've notified them. And that's social media companies, credit card firms, banks, energy firms, lots of different companies. I think that's amazing. amazing. 950 yes. companies or outlets or whatever it is. Mm. But we've put links to all that advice on our website. It's bbc.co.uk slash Britain. And if you've had dealings with a company's bereavement team and they either really helped or just made it a very tough time for you, please do let us know. We are Rip Up Britain at bbc.co.uk. Felicity, thank you. Thanks. Time now for our advice clinic, the place to come for help with those problems that you just can't seem to fix. Well, with me in the advice clinic today is personal finance expert from Telegraph Money, Emma Munbode. Morning to you, Emma. Hi. Now, question of the day, are you an Elton John fan? I am, of course. Well, that's, that's useful because we're joined now by fellow Elton John fan, Linda Williams from her home in Bangor, Northern Ireland, because she needs your help today. Hello, Linda. Hello. Now, I know you've got a problem that goes back to, what, 2018, when you spent £333 on tickets to see the rocket man himself. Tell me what happened. The concert was going to be taking place in 2020. Then we had COVID, then Elton had health problems. Um, so the concert then was taking place in March 2023. And it just felt like it was a hassle. And so I thought, oh, well, you hear about people who sell tickets. So I'll have a look at that and what's the worst that can happen. Well, the best that happened is that you actually sold it on a platform called Viagogo. It's a, a, a platform for reselling concert tickets. And they actually, yeah, and you sold them for 430 quid. So, so you actually made a profit. Yeah, yeah, that was a great result. Well, that must have been good news. So what happened next? I got um, various emails from them um, confirming the sale. We um, sent the tickets by a courier as we were instructed to got an email back from them saying we've got the tickets. So that all seemed fine. And um, then it came to the morning of the concert. I got two emails from them. The first one saying that they had cancelled the sale of the tickets, didn't give me any reason. And the second email told me that I had incurred a service charge of £142.56, 
which they were taking from my bank account. And were you getting the money for the tickets? No. You didn't get the money for the tickets and they were going to charge you a service charge? That's right. Crikey. Emma, what's going on here? It sounds like there's been a bit of an internal failure here at Biogogo. Um, they've obviously got certain procedures that they need to follow before they can allow people to buy and sell on the platform. Um, and for some reason, some of those steps were missed um, and then obviously found out about when it's too late. And so obviously you've been left out of pocket because of that, which is really unfair. Selling tickets yes. on these platforms can be a bit of a minefield anyway, can't they? So what are your Indeed. tips? Yes, yeah, so first of all, if you've purchased tickets and you need to get rid of them or sell them on, I would go to the source where you purchased the tickets originally and see if you can either get a refund or do a resale through them instead. Um, if you do have to use a resale site, make sure you do your um, checks online, check review sites. Trustpilot is a good place to start. Um, speak to friends and family and social media for good feedback on how certain sites work. And obviously go through the site itself, check the terms and conditions and the complaints procedure just so you know what, who you can turn to if things suddenly go wrong. Um, and what I would also say is make sure there are clear contact details on the site so you know who you can speak to in person if you suddenly have a dispute. But overall, you feel, as we did, that there was something not quite right here. Definitely. It's not fair that you've been left out of pocket um, with a service charge and um, no tickets at all. No, absolutely. So, as you could imagine, we were able to get rather more answers out of Viagogo than you were. And it's told us that concerns were incorrectly raised about the validity of your tickets and the £142 that you were charged was so that people who bought your tickets would still be able to go to the show. But also, Viagogo realised their error and it has apologised. It is refunding you, which we hope you're now very pleased about. Yes, I am, of course. I'm very pleased. It was a very stressful experience and I felt so foolish. Most important question, are you still an Elton John fan? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you may not have been able to go to the concert, but I'm sure you can buy some more of his discs. <laughs> Linda, thank you very much indeed for telling us about that. And Emma, thank you for your advice on, on buying tickets. <laughs>
to other houses. When we moved into the house, we were aware that we would have to use this treatment plant, uh, but we didn't think it was going to be an issue. Julie March bought this house near Poole, Dorset in 2016. And it came with a quirk. Along with some of her neighbours, the house was connected to a private sewage system, not the main drains. This meant they only paid their water company for their supply. All sewage and drainage charges were paid to a private firm called the Astor Group, which owns and manages the sewage system. I've never lived anywhere where we haven't been on main drains. But we spoke to the neighbours before we moved in and they were telling us it wasn't too bad and we understood it was going to be sort of 30-something pound a month. But to Julie's surprise, since 2016, the monthly bills have been far from consistent. Over the years since we've lived here, the costs have just fluctuated so much. Sometimes it was sort of 50, 60 pound, but then as time went on, I think we were paying 44. But after six years of paying anything between 40 and 100 pounds a month, in April 2022, it went to 142 pounds a month. And then in 2023, Julie was hit with another increase. This is April 2023. They're charging £205 a month. And then the most recent one has come through, which is um, July 2023, um, right the way through to March 24. They're going to charge me £274 a month. I can't carry on. It's, I, I actually just can't afford it. And when I've complained, they've said they'll disconnect me. I've no idea what will happen then. Unsure what to do for the best, Julie decided to pay a sum that she could afford, £85 a month. But that means that every month there's another £189 of debt being added to her Astra account. It's building up and up and up and I will be even more in debt. It's just a continuous circle, really, of them charging whatever they like and me struggling to pay it. By December 2023, Julie owed £2,821. It's my dream house and I want to stay as long as I can. I guess it just worries me because nobody would want to buy this house. The Astor Group manages sewerage plants for around 450 homes right across the UK. And many others have also been on the receiving end of rocketing direct debits. Among them, Joanne Nash and her neighbours from East Tivoli in Hampshire. The sewage treatment plant is for the 11 houses that are in the road. Everybody's connected to it by a drain that goes through the back gardens. The 11 homes connected to the same plant used to be owned by the council, but over the past 30 or more years, many have been sold to individuals. When Joanne bought hers in 1999, the council still managed the sewage system and she paid around £23 a month. But by 2001, the sewage system management was outsourced to a private company. And by 2012, Asta had taken over. Joanne says the bills have been increasing since then, and by the start of 2022, her monthly payment had risen to £126 a month. And Asta told residents it would rise again in September to 288 As if a hike in future bills wasn't enough, Asta then delivered an increase on bills Joanne had already paid back in 2021. Total to pay £969, just like that. I just don't have an extra £1,000. Joanne believes that some of these increased bills are a result of what she sees as Asta failing to properly maintain the plant, even as far back as 2015. A report commissioned by Asta raised concerns about a build-up of silt, and questions are now being asked about whether enough has been done over the years to keep it running. I contacted Asta. They said the extra costs had been incurred because there was extra tankering. Um, the plant had been stoppered, which meant that the effluent wasn't draining out, and there was then a tanker needed far more frequently to actually empty out all of the contents from the tank. Joanne and many of her neighbours wonder what they've been paying for all these years if some of it wasn't going towards maintenance and into a sinking fund to cover big repair bills or one-off charges. 
They now know there was no sinking fund, so they're facing unaffordable bills. I was made redundant a couple of years ago. Um, I'm a carer for my son and my daughter is, is a student. It's not fair. It's just astronomical amount of money. You know, what's it going to be next year? With Asta refusing to budge, local councillor Nick Adams King has stepped in to try and help. Hey, Joanne, how are you? Hi. Yeah, good to see you. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. The people here have lived here mostly for many years, young families, uh, people who bought their houses many years ago, people who have uh, worked really hard to afford their homes. Barbara Bascom lives opposite Joanne with her elderly parents. Working three jobs to try and keep my head above water. And you're looking um, after your parents as well? Yes, yes. They've been living here for 57 years. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't just sell up because it wouldn't be fair on them. And the scale of the problem concerns Nick. In my area, there are over 250 people facing these kind of costs. There's no cap on the costs. When we spoke to Test Valley Borough Council, it told us that the sewage treatment plants were in good order and met environmental standards when Asta took over responsibility for them and their maintenance in 2000. Asta need to take responsibility for the fact that they should have been looking after the sewage treatment plants better. They've not put money aside to keep it up to date or to replace it or refurbish it when it's needed. For now, just like Julian Dorset, both Barbara and Joanne are paying a monthly amount they can afford, but the amount they owe Asta keeps rising. You almost feel like you want to bury your head in the sands. I wake up at night worrying about it. It's totally unpredictable every time you get a letter. It almost takes over our whole lives. It's just not fair. When we spoke to Asta about those cases, it said it must maintain the treatment plants to environment agency standards and pass some of the cost of that maintenance on to customers, arrangements which Asta says were clearly set out when customers signed their original contracts. Asta said that in some cases, the treatment plants are nearing the end of their life, so they do require additional maintenance, but it does intend to replace some of them with more modern, more efficient versions. However, this, of course, comes at a significant cost. Asta also told us that it has capped maintenance charges at no more than £3,500 a year for homeowners and that its social housing tenants paid less than £600 in the last financial year, with the firm itself investing more than £700,000 subsidising these charges. Asta added that it is committed to supporting customers as much as it can and that its team is available to discuss any concerns or to help set up payment plans. Well, Emma Mumbold is back with me again here in the studio to discuss this. Emma, I'm going to come to you a bit later because we're joined now by Nick Adams-King, who is the local councillor that you saw in the film there. Nick, I know you've been trying to help these tenants uh, and these owners on this estate. Who have you been talking to to try and get help? So, um, Angela, we've been trying to uh, talk to the various regulators, Ofwat and the Consumer Council for Water, but because this is a private relationship between the homeowners and uh, Asta, then they can't really become involved. We're reliant now on trying to find some legal help for the residents to see if there is anything in the original agreement between the council and Asta when the houses were transferred, to see if there's anything that we can do with that to help them. It seems then as if the council were the original people to let these uh, individuals down, not just Asta then. Well, we're still looking at the agreement. There might be uh, in there a requirement that Asta had to manage things to an acceptable standard. Um, and so that's something that we're looking at. Why don't you just take responsibility back and make the council now responsible for the sewage system? It doesn't take away the fact that the sewage treatment plants now don't work. Um, and somebody needs to take responsibility for those. The reason that the council handed over the properties in the first place was that they didn't have the ability to maintain them in the way in which they would like. Well, it all sounds as if it's going to end up in the hands of the lawyers, but uh, do I take it then you're not giving up, Nick? No, we're not giving up at all. Aston need to treat these people fairly and properly. 
And so uh, they can expect us to keep talking to them. I'd like to turn back to Emma now. There may be people who find themselves in a very similar position to this, um, having to have a private contractor look after the sewage system. What would your advice be to them before they sign their lease? So I would say, first of all, these alternative sewage systems aren't always obvious. So you might not be aware of it when you first look to buy or move into a property. Your lettings agent, if you're renting, should make you aware of any sort of systems in place with the utility companies that are different to standard systems. Um, and if you're purchasing the property, it's your conveyances with responsibility to make you aware of that as well. Um, contact the company if you can, ask them exactly how it works, if there's a sinking fund in place for emergency works, um, how much your bills can increase year on year, and also ask them for all of that in writing so you've got it written down somewhere. Um, I would also say speak to the local residents, they'll be able to give you a very clear, um, unvarnished view of how it all works and anything you should be concerned of, and that will also give you the questions that you can ask the uh, conveyancer or the lettings agent later on. Nick, thank you very much indeed. And Emma, also thank you very much for joining us. Time now for our second visit of the day to the Advice Clinic, where I've asked Felicity Hannah to help some viewers who've come unstuck after they chose to save money on tech gadgets by buying refurbished rather than new. Carol Reynolds on an email says she bought a refurbished phone but I'm afraid it developed a fault within just a couple of weeks. Now, the company said it would send a replacement, but then went totally quiet. So the point is, Felicity, does she have weaker consumer rights because of the situation? No, she absolutely doesn't. She's still covered by the Consumer Rights Act, and that means that the item has to be as described, it has to be fit for purpose, it has to be of a satisfactory quality. And if there is a fault, if there is a problem with something that's refurbished or secondhand, then the seller has to tell her about that in advance. And if they don't, then she can demand a return, a replacement, a repair. Um, after six months, though, I would say that the, the burden is on the buyer at that point. And is it a good idea to take a photograph, for example, if you have bought something like that? Now, I'm a big fan. I don't buy something refurbished or secondhand and then leave it sitting in the box for a few months. Get it out. If there's damage to it, I like to take a picture with the packaging in the background so that no one can say I've taken it out and broken it myself. I have an email, actually, from Joe Shaughnessy, and he says that he bought a refurbished phone, not from the manufacturer, and it arrived damaged. The online shop he bought it from was initially happy to take it back. But after inspecting it, they said Joe must have caused the accidental damage and so his 12-month warranty was void. So what can he do? Well, Joe shouldn't panic. I mean, as a buyer, he has consumer rights. It is up to the seller to prove that uh, the buyer caused the damage. He's got a right to a refund, a repair or a replacement. Now, he's going to have to go through a small claims court if it's an online retailer. But if he's gone through a platform like eBay, it's worth going through their internal claims process first. It's much easier and they will understand what it is that he's entitled to. Thank you very much indeed, Felicity. Now, over the years, we've told many stories of people who were duped by fraudsters into transferring their savings into supposedly safe accounts when they were actually handing their money straight to the scammers. And in that time, we've also seen the rules to protect people get progressively tighter. In a moment, I'll be hearing about potentially game-changing new provisions that we hope will stop us ever being contacted by people in this situation again. But first, here's a reminder of the bad old days before any of those rules existed. Jonathan Keats is a retired teacher and author, and the two of us go way back. So when I received a phone call from him in a frantic state back in 2015, I was incredibly concerned. Yes. So, Jono, we've known each other for quite a long time, haven't yes, we? Yes, about 20 years. Wow, that is yeah. a long time. Yes. It was one afternoon in November 2015 that Jono received an email, supposedly from NatWest Bank, warning him that several attempts had been made to hack into his online bank account and urgent action was required. So, Jono, this is the email that popped up in your account. Yes, this is it. When I look at this, I see that it's, first of all, headlined, re, multiple failed login attempts. So yes. that kind of sets you on edge, presumably. Yes. What uh, really scared me was this note which says, failure to restore full access can lead to permanent suspension of access to our online banking service. I mean, how did you feel when you saw that? And I thought, good God, somebody's got into my accounts. So, immediately, 
I had to ring this number. Now, given that Jono's entire life savings were in this account, a total of £120,000, he panicked, called the number on the email and found himself speaking to someone apparently in the NatWest fraud department. He said the NatWest security department thought that fraud was taking place. Small sums were being withdrawn from my account and from other accounts in the branch, and they wanted to catch the person involved in the branch. And he and wanted to I, get you yes, involved? Yes, he wanted to get me involved. Would I agree to do this? And I, of course, uh, said yes. The caller, who in reality had nothing to do with the NatWest fraud department, told Jono that his own money was at risk and must urgently be transferred into a safe account with a different bank, a job that had to be done in person at his local branch. So, Jono, we've reached the scene of the crime. Yes. Describe what happened when you went in there. I was not asked any questions about why I was moving this enormous sum to an account outside the bank. It was simply allowed to go through. All I was told was, uh, this will take till about five o'clock for it to go through. It was all too easy for the fraudster. By five o'clock that evening, the money was transferred out of Jono's account and into the hands of criminals. Jono's life savings had vanished. But so caught up was he in the drama that it wasn't until he got home and reflected on what had happened that the sinking realization he'd most likely been conned began to dawn, and that's when he rang me. Now, as I remember it, you rang us that evening, didn't you? Yes, I did. And I was in, as you may recall, state. a state, mm. basically. And you very kindly said that you would come when I went for my interview about this with the private banking manager. I remember that meeting because he said the key to this whole saga lies with what happened here at the bank, didn't he? That's it, yes. At the time, NatWest told us that its cashier did challenge Jono about transferring such a large amount, something he disputes. And the bank would not refund him since it said he willingly authorised the payments. And the financial ombudsman service ruled in the bank's favour. In the end, £25,000 was recovered from one of the banks that received the fraudster's cash. But Jono's life savings were decimated. And all these years on, he tells me, the whole trauma is still painful to remember. But regular viewers will know that since 2019, Victims of this type of bank scam, known as authorised push payment fraud, have had a much better chance of getting their money back after most banks signed up to a voluntary code designed to ensure genuine victims aren't out of pocket. However, the interpretation of that code has often meant that two banks can take a very different view of the same scam, with one reimbursing their customer in full while a customer of another bank is left penniless. Until now, it's not been clear which banks are more or less likely to reimburse you. But in a move that could make some people vote with their feet, that very revealing data is now in our hands. Well, I'm joined now by fraud lawyer Aaron Chohan. Aaron, we've never known which banks will uh, reimburse the most, so now I think we do. Yeah, now we have a, a report that's been published through the Payment Systems Regulator, the PSR. And they've said to the banks, we want this data about how you're dealing with authorised push payment fraud. And for the first time, we've got lots of data, so bear with me, lots of numbers coming our way. Now, it shows which are the better performing banks. Uh -huh. And this is interesting. We've got TSB, Nationwide and HSBC First Direct leading as the top three. And the bottom three are AIB, Danske Bank and Monzo. TSB says its 91% refund rate is down to the bank's decision to routinely refund fraud victims. Across all 14 banks, £389 million of authorised push payment fraud was committed. 61% of that was refunded, but in total, £152 million was not returned to victims. The stats also show, which is quite alarming which banks are most affected 
by authorised push payment fraud. So where's the risk higher for you as a consumer? TSB are in there, Santander, Monzo, Metro and Starling Bank. The data from the PSR has been really useful because you drill down, you can see for every 1 million transactions at Monzo, 141 are authorised push payment fraud. Starling, there's 127. Metro, 127 out of the 1 million. And Santander, 117 out of the million. So really useful data. And we're grateful for the PSR for producing that. Mm. Well, um, a lot of figures to get one's head around. And uh, joining us now on the line is Chris Hemsley from the organisation The Payment Systems Regulator, which you just referred to. Um, Chris, welcome. Why release this data? We want to ultimately prevent fraud, but then also um, protect people. And by publishing this data, it shines a light on both the firms that are, are doing more and are, by and large, looking after their customers, but also, importantly, those that we want to improve. Looking ahead, are you expecting the figures to be very different when they're next published? I think we already had feedback from firms saying that questions are being asked internally. How can we improve our position on this table? We also know that Financial Conduct Authority has already taken additional steps against some of the firms named in this report. So this should hopefully over time mean that these fraud numbers come down, which is ultimately what we want to see. Chris, thank you for now. Um, Aaron, just coming back to you, there's actually something on the horizon, I gather, that should transform those statistics. Is that correct? Yeah, so in October of this year, there's some new law coming into place that's going to make it compulsory for banks to reimburse victims of authorised push payment fraud. You're all going to be made to do it. So, Chris, um, based on that, what does that mean for the banks at the bottom end of the table? I think it highlights that there is a, a gap between sort of best in class and a number of the firms on that table. And it's incumbent on everyone to play their part here. And so there is more that these firms can do to just tackle this fraud in the first place. And then if they can't do that, to look after their customers. Chris, thank you. And you too, Aaron. Well, we spoke about all this to UK Finance, the body which represents the banks, and it told us that the financial services sector is at the forefront of efforts to tackle all fraud, whether that's through campaigns to educate the public, security systems to detect suspicious transactions, or paying hundreds of millions of pounds back to victims. It added, however, that other sectors should also play their part, noting that 94% of all authorised push payment scams start online or through telecommunications sectors, which UK finance says have no commercial incentive to root out the scams. We also contacted the three banks with the lowest reimbursement rates. Monzo told us that APP fraud is a huge industry-wide issue and that it has invested heavily in cutting-edge technology, AI and machine learning tools to protect its customers. Meanwhile, Danske Bank chose not to comment, but AIB told us that it's committed to protecting customers from fraud, raising awareness and supporting those who do fall victim. AIB said it investigates each case of APP fraud thoroughly and pointed out that it has the lowest level of APP fraud per million transactions, something it puts down in part to the level of protection and support that it has in place. Well, I'm afraid we're very nearly out of time for today, but if you've got anything to say about something in today's programme or indeed right throughout the series, do please drop us a line. It's ripoffbritain at bbc.co.uk. And that's also the address, of course, for any issues that you would like our team to have a look at. No problem is too small or too large. We can't, unfortunately, investigate every letter we get, but I promise you, we do try to get through as many as we possibly can. And we'll be back here delving into more of the stories you've sent us very soon. Until then, thank you so much for joining us. And from everyone on the team, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Midweek, and I guess you're thinking about the weekend. Robson Green knows great places to escape to. Press red. Be kind, and it could benefit you in more ways than one. Listen now on sounds to the new series of Just One Thing.